Welcome to the CTO studio. This week we talk to Joni Connell, engineer turned psychologist, works with dev teams, technical teams around communication. Check it out. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Welcome to the CTO Studio. I have a fellow podcaster, fellow engineer, but someone who turned psychologist. Psychologist. Welcome. Thank you. I was on your show, mm-hmm. and now you're on mine. How does it feel? Uh, Table is turned. I know. It's like no control. <laughs> I remember you were so meticulous about guiding me through the process, and with mm-hmm. me, it's just the Wild West. Are you okay? I'm okay. So far, so good. <laughs> so I was saying Joni Connell, and then I was corrected to Joni Connell. Yes. And then you said that you used to be O'Connell. Well, not me personally, but uh, forefathers, yes, from Ireland. But, you know, there was a period of time when sounding Irish wasn't necessarily a good thing Mm. over in England, also in uh, America. So they dropped the O and went to Connell instead of Connell to sound as English as possible. It's a little hard when a last name wants to be pronounced a certain way, but then it's it's not the correct pronunciation. (laughs) Do, how many people do you have to correct? Well, the the good people ask first. <laughs> <laughs> I see no, two N's and two L's. No, I have this problem all the time with yeah. my name. I'm not ATM. I'm ATM. <laughs> you don't dispense cash. No. I mean, I kind of do. <laughs> so you were, in, you were in engineering for eight years in Silicon Valley. Yes. Who was that with? Oh, different companies. And what did, what did you do? Well, I started out as a data communications design engineer for Tandem Computers for the young listeners. Wow. <laughs> that, that used to be actually a very big company in Silicon Valley. You know, right up there with HP and Apple were the other really progressive companies. Um, and uh, Tandem made mainframe computers that it was all about Tandem, meaning they had parallel processors, parallel everything, so they would never go down. Mm. And one of the biggest, most famous clients was the New York Stock Exchange. So that, you know, you don't want the stock exchange to go down, and so everything was redundant. And I did data communications, which means that back in the day, I helped uh, uh, mainframes communicate with modems to other other computers. Yeah. <laughs> Did those mainframes call young boys and say, shall we play a game? Uh, not that time. I don't think. I don't think. <laughs> Do you know the reference? Was that 2001? No, that was War Games. War Games, that's yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, shall okay. we play a game? Yes. That, f- that movie, just, I loved it and I was just, afraid of it i haven't seen that one since it came out so i just purchased it for like a dollar 99 on itunes yeah well i see that one in my future yes (laughs) so you did that in silicon valley and then decided after many years you were gonna you're more interested in in the people side of things yeah how did that happen well i guess i had really gone into engineering because i thought it was a good job for making money, being stable. I didn't want to be a millionaire or anything like that, like some of these entrepreneurs out there. I just wanted to have a good living. But um, I knew that people were always, you know, of interest, but it became really obvious when um, the other engineers around me were so into their work and debugging until two in the morning, and I just couldn't wait to leave and go do other things. And I said, you know what, this is it's not satisfying. And uh, this is not, you know, I feel stagnant. I'm not really going anywhere in my life. So, um, you know, I could tell you one story. I mean, I just remember visually there were 12 of us in our group and we had a manager and we had a staff meeting once a month 
I mean, not even once a week, but once a month back then, that's all I did. And we'd get into the conference room and you could just feel the tension, like nobody wanted to be there. And then he would go around the room and each person had to update on what their project was going on. And we'd get around the room and like person number 12, you know, we'd all be like, great. And he'd be like, okay. And it was kind of like school's out. Literally the doors would bust open and people would run out of the room. And I'm going, wow, this is kind of interesting because, you know, the people I'm with don't want to be around other people, uh, don't really have the skills to do it because like myself, as a, trained as an engineer, we, we learned how to design, debug, and write code and not have those interactions. So that's when I said, you know, this could really be a place to make a difference, to help people communicate better. Mm. And then did you, you made sort of a tough decision to leave? Like, did you, did you, did you go study or what did you do? Yeah. I, I actually I had a couple different jobs trying to get more people oriented. I did marketing for a semiconductor firm and then did consulting. And, but eventually I did, um, I decided to go back to graduate school. And, you know, it was because I was trying to get more people oriented and I kept getting pushed back into engineering roles, like very technical roles. And I realized, you know, to really go with the people route, I have to re-specialize because people just see me as an engineer. Mm. And so that's when I, you know, it took me a while. I, I took some classes at night just to make sure, you know, I was looking at psychology and originally I thought maybe I'll be a therapist, you know, or a counselor. And I did a, a volunteer work at a 24 hour hotline to check that out. And when somebody called in and said they were going to commit suicide, then they hung up on me. I said, no, I don't think I can do this. I don't have the nerves. Um, I wow. need to work with people who aren't having such dire problems. Mm. And so that's when I, I decided to go back and I studied social psychology with an emphasis on organizations and in the workplace. Mm. And that, and then did you form flexible work solutions? After that? Yes. Well, I first worked for a consulting firm for Personnel Decisions International, PDI. They were a really big uh, HR kind of consulting firm which then has uh, been bought out, um, switch names and all that. But I did that for a while and I taught at university and then ended up going out on my own to do the consulting uh, to have some more flexibility in my schedule as well. So what, what, service, like who, what service do you provide? Well, basically it's assessment and development for leaders and teams of people. And I tend to, my personal uh, niche is with technical people because I get them, they get me, and, and we sort of connect as opposed to some of my colleagues who were psychologists who came a very different path, uh, connect better with other folks, mm, right? Mm. So uh, I love to stick with, with the people I, that are sort of my tribe. Mm. And so do you go into companies who need leadersh like leadership development or communication development for their teams? Are, yeah. they, are they generally struggling with that? Is it mostly proactive or? Ha, yeah, well, what is, what is proactive in the business world? No, I tell you, there are a few different situations. One might be where uh, a company is looking at their uh, directors and above, perhaps, like their leadership uh, bench strength, you know, and their team, their executive team, and they might be saying, well, uh, what kind of uh, skill set do we have among these people and what do we need to hire? Who are we going to promote? You know, what's our succession plan? And I do the assessment there, which is figuring mm. out what the skill sets are of the individuals as well as you know, what the team is uh, made up and what kind of things they might want to develop or hire in. Um, so that's one thing. Another one is like just individuals who have moved up into leadership positions because that's really big. You know, I mean, especially in, the, it's not just um, like engineering and all, it's also science. I do a lot of biotech work too with real like technical people in that realm, but people who are, you know, super bright um, and they have an expertise and then all of a sudden they're promoted up to manage a team or, you know, direct something and they have to use a whole new set of skills. And they don't know what those are. I think you probably talk about that a lot at seven CTOs. But so helping individuals, you know, I do trainings and also coaching, usually with people who are high up in the organization. That's where the company wants to spend their money on mm, the leaders. So mm. then I can do one-on-one -on -one coaching. 
Um, and team building kind of uh, workshops. I do workshops in companies. Also, I collaborate and work at different universities around to do hmm. that. Mm-hmm. What are you What are you seeing in in tech companies? Like, what if you were to think about the top two or three challenges that you're seeing uh, around communication or you know around people? Like, well, what what are you noticing? Well, I would say like with the technical people. Um, I guess valuing some of the people skills is one of the things that comes up a lot because people often come and go, well, you might say the data, the data will show you what's right or logically this makes sense. Um, and, uh, trying to convince people that they should do something for those reasons and not really, um, focusing on that there are other maybe irrational or emotional reasons that come up. And it's not just people who are flaky, you know, crazy people. I mean, even the most rational people I know, I mean, they'll fight to the death arguing something to prove that they're right. And you're going, is that really rational? (laughs) You know, like, why do you have to be right? You know, I mean, so there are things that come up. People get very attached to things or or have things that go on in their lives that affect them at work. And as a leader, a manager of a team, you have to be able to handle those things and, and work those out or conflicts with people within the team, those kind of things. So um, realizing that, you know, I call it like a toolkit. That's, that's the way I, I deal with it with technical people is that there's not just a hammer. You know, you don't just pound things down mm. until people get it right. You need to pick the right tool for mm. the situation. And so I would say that, you know, what are the common errors? You know, it's like thinking that the hammer is going to solve all your problems, mm. uh, realizing that you need to be more flexible to the situation and perhaps valuing the people side and, and understanding how that will really help you and thinking about how people feel will help you make better decisions uh, rather than thinking it's irrelevant. Yeah, and I think that is a common challenge we have mm-hmm. as technical leaders, as CTOs, to, to, to sort of neg- negate that side of it, the mm-hmm. emotional need. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and especially if you think about the fact that it's compounding. So, you know, you might be a certain way today, not because of what happened today, but what happened two, three weeks ago. Right. And so it just mm-hmm. gets, you know, just gets worse and worse. And mm-hmm. so the the VP or the director ends up saying, well, I'm not a psychologist. I, I just need to get this work done. So what's right. the issue? Is right. that where you come in? Uh, well, you know, I can help solve specific problems, but often it's helping people develop the ability to do it themselves, mm. right? I mean, my goal is to get out of the company, right? To help them be self-sufficient. Do you have some tools you can talk about a little bit that uh, some of our listeners could maybe use or just think about mm-hmm. uh, who might be in current situations that are difficult to navigate around teams or communication? Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess uh, the tools that I talk about are really methods Mm. sort of to deal with things. And one of them that comes up would be triggers. Now, I'm not talking about uh, PTSD or anything like that, but just uh, before that term became popularized. Um, But there's something that will set you off, right? When you're in a meeting and somebody attacks your design or something or says something negative about it or there's somebody in the room that you just have been having this competition with or whatever it is, you know, that's a trigger. So I help people come up with ways to handle that, to recognize uh, when that's happening or when it will happen. That's even better, right? You want to recognize it in the moment, but you also want to plan for it um, and then give yourself a time out. So I would say grounding or centering before an interaction is the way to do that. And it's, Something that's really simple. It's, again, one of those things we think, oh, it's so woo-woo to do it like a meditation or something, even though that's becoming much more popular today. But um, if you take even five minutes, maybe 10, before you walk into a meeting and you think about like, okay, where do I need to be? How do I need to be coming across? Am I going to be in a situation where I'm presenting and somebody is going to be criticizing my design because that's their job, right? Um, How am I going to react to that? And so you can spend a bit of time uh, either just, you know, with your eyes closed, uh, 
doing a little relaxation exercise or even just having that thought process as you're going in so that you're ready ahead of time mm. and you have a plan. Mm. And then there's in the moment. Of course, it takes a while because, you know, we always have this ideal self, right? Oh, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm going to react really calmly. And then it happens and you still get red in the face, you know, so realizing that, okay, it's never too late. Even if you have said something that you might regret, you can say, you know what? I realize I'm, you know, um, you, you might say something like, I, I, I realize that uh, I'm feeling uh, uncomfortable with the situation. Let's all take a coffee break or something, mm, you and, know? And is someone actually saying those words? Yeah. I oh, feel uncomfortable. You could say, I feel uncomfortable, or I sense some tension here, or... You know, that didn't come out the way I wanted to. I need to think about this again. Why is it so hard to admit your emotional state? Because we've been taught so often not to. I mean, this comes out of, you know, uh, upbringing and pride, you know. You know, I, uh, I, was, I was driving in South Africa one day uh, recently, and on the radio there was a, a psychologist talking about children Mm -hmm. and their feelings mm -hmm. and she made the point that from a very young age we're teaching kids that they're, what they're feeling is not correct so for instance if if a kid says i'm afraid of the dark right. then my response is no no you're there's no need to be you're not mm -hmm. afraid or you know what's gonna and, and and we're we're almost instantly trying to tell them no you're not hurt you're not afraid you're not and and her point was just that from from such an early age we're not admitting or uh, to ourselves or to people around us how we feel because there's never sort of that validation of those feelings yeah interesting i would say that that's even more common today because people are trying to make i mean we always try to make kids feel better it's kind of what you're talking about but uh, as parents and other role models, we sit there and try to act like everything's fine. And we don't actually show the emotions either and show that we can handle it. You know, if we do feel scared or upset that we can work through it. Mm -hmm. So there's part of it is if w the adults are denying it all, then the kids are going to grow up that way too. Yeah. I, my, so my wife's a therapist. So I've... I have had a few moments where I've had to tell my kids that I am frustrated. Yeah. And it's very, very hard to do that. For some reason, I feel like I, they shouldn't, I should always be consistent and real. And, and if, if any sort of admission of I'm not doing too well right now just feels like it's not a natural step. It feels like it's an an unnatural step of vulnerability that of which the consequences are not predictable. Right. And then, uh, sorry, and then the other day, mm -hmm. out of the blue, my middle daughter said to me, Daddy, are you frustrated? <laughs> oh, how sweet. So I sent her to a room and... <laughs> <laughs> no, I never. Well, just think about it, though. I mean, how many opportunities have you had to do this and find out that people are actually glad that you said that? Almost always. Right. I mean, we fear what people are going to do and how they're going to react and they're going to think badly, but usually it brings you closer together. Usually it earns you more respect from others, you know, that you actually were uh, able to admit what was going on or that if you made a mistake like, oh, like that didn't come out the way I meant it, let me try again or reboot or something like that, you know, um, then people, oh, okay, and they'll listen. You know, but if you just don't do it at all and you keep going down that path, it's just going to get worse. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would be interested to see uh, how one can train your dev team to, to, to be open and honest about their emotions. Because mm -hmm. I think more often than not, your developers are going to bottle those things up for fear of coming across as, as unprofessional. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not talking about about losing it i'm just talking about being the, i mean imagine saying to your boss i'm not comfortable with what you're talking about right now i mean that feels I, unheard of <laughs> i hear people doing that you know the thing is though um when i work with people it's all about authenticity not trying to turn you into somebody or not mm. you know and um doing it in a way that works for you so working through different vocabulary, different phrases uh, or sayings that you can come up with and find one or two that actually feels comfortable. 
Because if you don't say, if you don't think you could say, I feel uncomfortable, maybe there's something else you could uh. say that would work for you. I'm trying to think of what that might be. Um, you know, that's kind of like, that's not working for me. Or, you know, sometimes we'll say that kind of thing. Um, that makes me rock back and forth, cold and lonely in the corner. <laughs> I do have people who are very expressive who actually talk about curling up under the bed in the fetal position and stuff. So you're saying you're saying as a tool, um, you know, instead of having back to back meetings or instead of seeing my meeting is ending at ten and the next one starting yeah. at ten, you say my meeting's ending at nine fifty because I need ten minutes to visualize and prepare and, and, and do some sort of centering exercise before I go into the next meeting. Right. Right, because people often don't do that. They just get back to back to back to back, and they don't even think about where they need to be or what what kind of impression they want to make on others or what kind of challenges they might run into. You just show up. Imagine if we had a corporate culture where when the meeting is 10 o'clock, it starts with a centering exercise. I do know teams who do that. Really? Yes, I do. Um, I see that. You know, it's not something that I've... Uh, necessarily coach people to do, but I do know te teams, uh, even dev teams who do that. They say, you know what, we, at the beginning of every meeting, and I think, wow, that's very progressive. Wow. It's not something I see very often, yeah. but people are starting to do that. Do kind of you thing. have an example of that? Do they just do a breathing exercise or a, a meditation? Jumping jacks? A meditation is what I've heard people, you know, they might take uh, a couple of minutes just to all sit around the table and do some kind of meditation. Um, you know, there are other things, too, where people do have breaks or are getting up to stretch, stretch breaks, but that's a little bit different. But sometimes uh, some centering exercise and sometimes we'll do a check in. That would be another thing. You go around the table. It's like, wh how's everyone feeling right now? Um, you know, wh what's going on? And uh, finding that, I mean, that's another tool for a meeting is to say, take 10 minutes at the beginning of the meeting to see where people are at before you start in that way you know sometimes you don't see it on their faces or somebody's really good at masking it but they might be like wow you know something really bad happened on the way to work this morning mm. you know i witnessed this accident which really freaked me out i'm not really here today you know mm. and you can say oh, okay that you know let's figure out how to handle that you know or like the like the one word check-in or something yeah yeah you could do that the one word check-in is is profound mm -hmm. just like a Give us one word mm -hmm. how you're feeling right mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and at the end of a meeting too, sometimes I've seen that as well, so that you can find out if people are satisfied or if they're feeling frustrated at the end of the meeting. Yes, yes. My wife, uh, oftentimes when I sense that something's wrong, I'd say to her, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And then she would say to me, I, you know, instead of making it about her, I should make it about us. Oh, yeah. And I should say, are we okay? Uh, mm -hmm. and not, you know, not the royal we, but like, mm -hmm. are you and I okay? And put it in the context of the relationship more than, oh, you know, are you okay? What's <laughs> up? You know? <laughs> I know, it's all your problem. <laughs> so you authored a book called Flying Without a Helicopter. Yes. Did you invent how to fly without a helicopter? <laughs> I came up with a title, but uh, people, uh, the helicopter, um, no, <laughs> the flying without a helicopter is all about the helicopter parenting mm. phenomenon. And how does one fly without that? Well, yeah, it's all about landing the, the parents who mm. are hovering overhead and um, are also mowing the lawns ahead of you, you know, a path ahead of you, those lawnmower parents too, but um, the whole purpose of this book was uh, I've been doing consulting for a number of years with leaders and other professionals in the workplace, and they were having uh, challenges with the younger people coming in. And, you know, we've heard all of these um, different uh, stereotypes mm. and criticisms mm. of, say, millennial generation mm. and, and next generation as well coming up after. And there's all this conflict and realizing it's not just about people of different ages it's how parenting has shifted and i had a kid i still have a kid but she was much younger at the time and i saw that people were doing things much differently than they had when i was a kid and so having a foot in both worlds and the psychology background uh, i put two and two together and said look 
you know, when you uh, raise your kid, when you're making decisions, you know, to do things for them, like go and talk to the teachers, uh, going and uh, inviting them, uh, getting them invited to birthday parties when their friends don't want them there, you know, and uh, resolving all these issues. Um, then when they grow up and have a real life, you know, like get a job, they aren't prepared to go talk to their boss or interact with the teams because they've never experienced mm. those kind of conflicts. Because someone's done that for them. Yes. And so, you know, there may be circumstances where you think, no, I'm going to do it for them. They need it. Or, you know, this particular kid isn't really, you know, adept at it or whatever. But just making that conscious decision of there are consequences. And uh, as they get older and go into the workplace, things uh, will arise. If my 10-year-old coach, soccer coach, keeps yelling at them for the duration of the soccer game, mm-hmm. Uh, at what point can I get up and go just shut his face <laughs> and intervene? Well, I don't know if I have the right answer to that, but there will be consequences no matter what choice you make, both for you and for the children and from everyone else in the at the game, right, at the match. Because, you know, uh, when you stay silent, are you silently agreeing with the coach? Which all the parents are doing. Mm-hmm. They're just not saying anything. Yeah, or is it something you'd want to do after the match and say, hey, next time, you know, let's let's talk about this or in the middle of it. You know, the, I, I think it would be maybe how you want your your daughter to resolve a conflict, get mm. up and yell at the coach in the middle mm. of the game or not. So mm. these are things that you might want to think about. Mm. I'm going to think about that. <laughs> My gut tells me I shouldn't interfere. Um. I I would find out personally how it felt for your daughter. See if that uh, mm. has an effect on her. She has said that it's it doesn't affect her, but yeah. you know, ten year old. I don't know mm-hmm. what. So I have this little uh, I have this little thing I do with my kids. Okay. Around their devices. mm Hmm. I might be revolutionizing a generation right now, but I have a uh, uh, a ritual where I tell them that they can use the iPad as long as they want, as whenever they want. They all three have iPads. Yep. And they, whenever they ask me how long can we do the iPad, I say it's not my decision. And then I that whenever they ask me if they can do the iPads or use the iPads, I say, that's not my decision to make. And, but what I do tell them is, is I want them to regulate. Mm -hmm. So I tell them uh, to make sure that they listen to themselves, use their common sense as much as they can, and regulate their usage of the iPads. Mm Mm-hmm. So when the time comes for them to ask if they can use the iPads, I say, hey, you know my answer, as long as you regulate, you can do iPads whenever you want. Or if they ask me, how long can we do it for? I say, you can do as long as you want, as long as you're regulating. And then the only way that I intervene when I notice that things are getting out of hand is I just say, hey, kids, are you guys regulating? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you went off and jumped on the trampoline and then came back. So I just have to ask a very simple question, and I have three very well-trained humans who are interacting at a level that is, I think is amazing, because I know that my wife once said to me, do you want your kids to act a certain way when you're in the room and when you're not in the room? Yeah. And that's why I came up with the whole regulation thing. Um, What are your comments on that? Mm-hmm. And B, how how do you think technology is shaping their little brains? Okay, so I have a couple different reactions. So first of all, I would say to me and in terms of the book I wrote and uh, the research and showing people how to act responsibly, that is the best, most ideal way for teaching kids to be responsible for themselves. Does it work for every child? No, 
some kids just don't have that ability to regulate themselves. And so some kids need more structure. I remember when I was a kid, I was one of those people who, you know, did all my homework and got it all done. And I was just so motivated in, intrinsically, I guess you would say. My sister wasn't. And she asked my parents to give her more structure and to, you know, not permit her to watch TV or go out. And what kid asked their parents mm, to do sounds... that, but she knew she needed it. Huh. And so, um, you know, acknowledging that, that some people just have more discipline than others and are able to do that, um, you know, and they can be taught to do that. So, yes, ideally, absolutely teaching them how to do it themselves, just like people who ban uh, all the channels and everything. And the kids don't learn how to be responsible and what to look at on the Internet. Right. Mm. You know. Um, you know, avoid predators on the internet, avoid scams. If they're not learning those skills later in life, they might get mm. scammed or whatever it is. Uh, so they need to be uh, to be able to learn those things. And, and we have a very short opportunity as parents mm -hmm. to be doing that with mm -hmm. them because mm -hmm. they're going to be doing it without us right. very soon. Yeah. And so, you know, the research does show that uh, helping them make the decisions on their own, especially this is also in the teen years, because after that point, after adolescence, there is a period of time where uh, the brain is not as plastic as it used to be. And then they will sort of, uh, you know, stabilize on their decision-making ab abilities. And if they've never learned it, then they're not going to learn it as easily later. Mm. Um, so there was a second part to your question. Oh, how is the technology affecting their brains? Okay, there is increasing uh, amount of research on that. Uh, one great place to look for that is the Center for Humane Technology. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're up in um, uh, Northern California. Uh, people who have worked at some of the big tech companies like Facebook, Google, and uh, elsewhere who have started to see the detrimental effects um, of technology and how to make it more humane. You know, how uh, we've seen in the news that they certain companies and designers have put in uh, algorithms to addict people, you know, especially with the games, right? To addict people and to Facebook to addict them. And some people are more susceptible to that than others, right? Just like with, with drinks and, mm. you know, drugs and all that mm. too. Some people are more susceptible than others. Um, but uh, so when we, when we see that kind of thing going on, young people, like you said, they, they um, are, are fresher in their brains. They don't really know the consequences of that. They might... Um, not understand it and that's up to us to help them learn but then there's other evidence too about just you know the the light uh the blue light all these different things um can be affecting their brains so the key really is moderation i think that's true with everything in life mm. you know if, if you're spending eight hours a day on your um iphone or ipad or whatever device you use that's probably too much right but if you play with it or use mm. it uh, mm. judiciously mm. you know you're learning some skills and you're doing all right yeah I, I almost fell off my chair the other day when my five-year-old was googling something <laughs> so somehow she got yeah. through an app it switched over to a browser which then she typed she didn't know the dot com so she just started typing phrases yeah and, you know, I was completely and utterly shocked and terrified when I saw. And she said to me, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm on Google, Daddy. I was like, wow. And that's a teaching moment, <laughs> right? Y'all get off Google right now, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, 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 love, uh, I love talking to engineering types who became psychology types. Okay. Why is that? Because I feel like you're a student of what makes engineering click. It's kind of your people. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, you're a student of how, to, how their brains work, how they interact. And ultimately, every CTO, every director, every VP wants their teams to act more cohesively and produce mm -hmm. more results. Mm -hmm. So... Psychology isn't always the thing that, that they go to. It's like, you know, it's, and so to have a, the rare species who went back to school 
to learn this stuff i think is 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 fantastic well it's it's a nice uh addition to the team i would say to get someone to help out and get people thinking in those terms because it may not come naturally to some people um you know just people are individually different and being more or less psychologically minded is certainly an individual difference mm. yeah so we're almost done wow that's gone fast i know it's uh it's you know i love i love some conversations that feel like they were intros yeah <laughs> do you have uh um do you have any anything you'd like to 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 bring up for me anything that uh you're thinking about right now or um i think you're right aren't you writing another book or yes i'm working on the tech effect which is dealing with some of the issues we've been talking about um but it's about the some of the detrimental effects of technology, particularly communication technology. And obviously, technology has been a great thing for our society, our world. Um, but we, if we don't uh, think about it and be more deliberate in how we use it, we're losing some of the human touch, the mm. human, uh, humanistic aspects mm. of our lives. Is that so. like trying to resolve a conflict through text? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, we, we just go to things and um, forget that sometimes we, ne we need the face-to-face -face or at least a phone call, the voice, um, you know, customer service. It's not always um, resolvable easily uh, by a bot or, uh, you know, um, texting on, on the web as well, that sometimes we need to have those interactions to explain complex problems or or deal with those emotions. Is there a telltale sign that I'm too deep into tech in my communication? In other words, uh, if I become, if I'm texting too much, or if I, are there certain things that I should absolutely stay away from? If I realize that I'm, I, I'm, this is the tech effect. Is I'm too deep into that. I would say one of the things to watch out for is when you don't feel comfortable. Uh, actually interacting with people at some point. I mean, some people just are never comfortable, but, you know, if you have been and then suddenly you realize like, oh no, that's just too uncomfortable. And I said with a lot of younger people who've grown up dealing with text and um, not dealing with the interactions face to face, they get to work and they don't even know how to have those conversations there, you know, they, so that when you're feeling like you're just not even comfortable You'd rather, oh, just text me instead, mm. then I think that's a little bit of a flag to say, maybe I'm too deep. Yeah, because I feel like that's already happening around voicemail. Mm -hmm. I mean, voicemail used to be a thing, and now it's an annoyance. <laughs> yeah. You really left me a voicemail? <laughs> I know, I left one for somebody just yesterday, and I'm going, oh, I bet you she's annoyed at me, because <laughs> I didn't email or text her yet. That's so funny. And yet, and yet, uh, and yet, when you listen to the voicemail, it's so valuable, especially if it's a friend or mm -hmm. a, because A, you realize in this day and age, they took the time to leave a message. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's usually hearing their voice does something to the brain. Yeah. Texts are just void of, of, of all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're curt, you know, short messages so that, a lot can be read into it. And that's another thing, too. I mean, when you start realizing that you're confused about what someone's saying to you, that's when you pick up the phone, right? Instead of just trying to figure it out and assume they mm. meant the worst, mm. you know, uh, ask them. <laughs> well, Johnny, thank you for being on the show. This was, I, I love it. Thanks for being with us. And we will see you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Promise. All right. <laughs> it's been Cheers. great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have you chatted with the CTO lately? Hi. Thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at Seven CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So. Thank you for listening.